Hello, Hello. everybody, and welcome to uh, our next EDW session called Joining Law and Data and You, which is presented by William Tannenbaum, who is a partner at Moses and Singer, Singer LLP. All audience members are muted during these sessions, so please submit your questions in the Q&A window on the right-hand side of the screen, and our speaker will respond to as many of them as possible at the end of our talk. We also want to note that there is a linked form at the bottom of the page where audience members are able to leave evaluations for the session, uh, and we really encourage you to do that. It's very useful. So let's go ahead and get started. Thank you, and welcome, William. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been at both virtual and live conferences, and I think this one has gone quite well so far virtually. Um, I'm a lawyer, as the LLP in my company name indicates, and our firm has a dedicated data practice where we do everything from privacy and cybersecurity and data agreements up to uh, securing rights and building data centers. And the presentation I'm going to have is not a legal presentation, but it's a presentation about law and a presentation about where uh, certain steps should be followed uh, in order to achieve compliance. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide. And we've all heard of privacy by design and security by design. And as you all know, that is to build in privacy and security rather than to try and retrofit them. And one of the things I'm going to address is regulatory compliance by design. And that follows the same model, that uh, it needs to be done upfront. There are some steps about doing it uh, both legally and practically, which I'm going to address. And as with the other two items, it's very, very difficult to retrofit it. And it's definitely a budget buster if you try and do it that way. And it'll create, um, uh, let's just say controversy with the IT department and all kinds of things, which in the end reflect poorly on a lot of people who are involved. So in addition to uh, talking about regulatory compliance, I'm going to illustrate some of these issues by using examples from healthcare which is a very data heavy uh, industry. And I'm also going to address some of the hidden data management and data management requirements behind a new privacy law in California called the California Privacy Rights Act. Uh, if you remember GDPR and loved it, you will love the new California law. And I'll get into that later. And then I'm going to address a question which always comes up which is what is the IP status and ownership issues uh, with respect to data and what do we do about them both offensively and defensively. So let me start on this slide by discussing the business context uh, that I see and provide this as um, kind of a window into how law departments look at the problem because I'm sometimes retained by the data professionals and sometimes by the law departments who don't understand uh, the role of data professionals or the role of data or all kinds of things because um, this is not something you learn in law school and it's not something you learn as a baby lawyer. So we go back to kind of the basics as to why data is important. And I think if you heard John Ladley's presentation yesterday, when he said the definition of data is something that happened. And I found that a very kind of clarifying statement. Um, and to the extent that it's a corporate asset, it is taking that knowledge, and I'm not going to debate the difference between data and information and knowledge and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you have data, then you wanna use it to generate a competitive advantage, perform business intelligence, have high quality data so you can trust machine learning models. And then, as I said before, you have to allocate IP ownership, license rights, and use rights. The law department, um, with the help of data professionals, is uh, responsible for regulatory compliance. Um, it is uh, often out of the loop um, because things don't get brought to its attention until late in the game. Its goal is to protect the company against fines the regulatory sanctions, private lawsuits such as class actions, and other legal penalties. 
And one of the ways it does this is by confirming that even if something went wrong, the company took the proper steps at the proper time and that there were good internal corporate practices. Um, and that will help withstand uh, an investigation by a regulatory body or, or a lawsuit. Um, it's also an intra-company multi-party problem in that there are different company divisions having different expectations and themselves being different sources of data. And uh, the repository entity might not have any familiarity with the regular require, regulatory requirements, but the data that it collects is being repurposed for another purpose. And that's where a lot of problems come up. Uh, I'm gonna focus on data flow charts because I often uh, see this in my practice is how the problem gets presented internally and how it gets presented to the law department and then what the law department is looking at these things and trying to decide what to do. So if, as I go through the presentation, I think you'll understand why this is a good way to approach how, uh, how the problem is done. Um, I'm speaking to you as uh, data professionals who ultimately are going to have to work with or have your work uh, worked on by the general counsel's office. And I wanna give you a sense of how they see the world so that you can uh, help the company by helping meet that perspective. So here are some common problems that I've seen. Uh, someone in the company, often the engineers who are in charge of product development, prepare flowcharts. Um, and these are often uh, focused on whether, uh, you know, certain documents should be put in separate corporate applications, when approvals are needed, escalation steps, and all kinds of things like that. And a common problem is when you look at these charts, there's no real step for determining what regulations apply. And the regulations can apply either to the product itself that's developed or steps that have to be followed so that the product development complies with the regulatory steps. Um, and to put some meat on that bone, um, that's very apparent in healthcare and financial services and other data-driven products where the end result might be, you know, a pretty plain vanilla product or service, but how it was built depends on regulatory compliance. Another issue that I see when working with these charts is if they include this step, it is often too far down the chain and it's uh, not timely and it has some aspects of retrofitting rather than building it in from the beginning. Another thing that I see is in the next bullet point, which is that there is uh, no time to set realistic expectations to negotiate with the outside company or for the uh, internal lawyers to get the advice they need either from within the company or from their external lawyers. And um, law just sometimes it goes really quickly. Sometimes it takes a long time and to set expectations you have to build in a block of time there. Um, and there you should be guided by company practices. But the most important part is to make sure you understand that there is time for the other side to disagree with your contract or your company's contract and what to do about it. And then, uh, as I said before, but it's worth repeating, the department that is uh, collecting and using the data, um, which is in turn going to be shared with another part of the company um, is just sharing data without knowing what the regulatory requirements are for the downstream use. And that's precisely the problem that we're addressing. So um, what are the solutions here? Um, you need to identify the regulatory requirements and put the branches for action in the chart, depending on the requirements that are proper. Put them in early, um, allow time to commit to a realistic timeline and uh, check to make sure that the timing makes sense because uh, lawyers have their own pressures um, and you just have to know what they're going to do to give them time to line up the resources they need to do. Uh, as I said uh, before, it might be internal or external legal counsel that are involved with this. 
Um, and we have to indicate where legal needs to be involved, which is usually at the beginning with regulatory compliance. And in addition to legal, there are other departments. There's usually the regulatory, sometimes called the compliance department. And there's usually a privacy officer and a privacy department that may or may not be implicated depending on the data that's being used. So now let's uh, turn to healthcare as an example. And as I said, uh, the problems that healthcare faces are that there is a strong need to use data and data quickly. And actually COVID has accelerated all this um, because what I've seen is hospitals who were slow to update their data management processes or slow to roll out and deploy mobile applications and things like that move very quickly to free up doctors so that they could be providing care to COVID patients and using technology and data uh, more quickly to free up the doctors to do that. So, um, and that applies, I think, to a lot of companies. And as another parenthetical on a parenthetical, I think one of the effects of COVID will be to increase automation, whether it's robotic process automation or other similar things. And that in turn, you know, whether it's a smart chat bot or something like else, something else like that, uh, requires good data practices. So as I've said before, um, these are the same problems that I've just mentioned. Um, and they're just more time sensitive because HIPAA has very severe requirements on what you can and cannot do with data. And the reason that I'm pointing this out is um, if you want to have complete freedom of use of data in healthcare, at the end of the day, you want to have de-identified data. Um, and one of the problems that comes up that I'll mention because it applies here in other industries is that if you're using data for research purposes, it takes the form of a safe harbor where the regulatory requirements are less strict. However, if you have designed your program for uh, meeting the research requirement and the research exceptions actually, then when you expand beyond that to product development or product deployment, you've gone way beyond what the regulations allow. And that is a problem for everyone up and down the chain. So at this point, I'd like to kind of show, uh, in addition to a flow chart, uh, I've done my best, but I realize this may be hard to read on a, on a screen in a virtual presentation, but it basically um, shows the steps that should be included in the process chart that I mentioned. So I'll just um, read this very quickly in case you can't. On the left side, we say, is um, personal information associated uh, with material to be received? And, and the answer is usually yes. So then the question is whether the site, and site usually is a hospital or a research institution, will de-identify the materials before they transfer them. Um, and if the site won't de-identify them, then who will? Uh, and then to figure out how to answer these questions, uh, it's very useful to have a personal information questionnaire filled out that non-lawyers can, uh, can look at and generate the information that lawyers need to know. And then over on the right side, we have a column and the top box says, when you've answered the questions about the identification, then you proceed to contracting. And then that goes down to the bottom. When you've done all your investigations, the question is, do you have the right level of consents? And it's all the HIPAA forms that we all sign when we go to the hospital. Um, and then if you have the consents, do you go to de-identification? Without getting into the weeds in, in HIPAA too much, you know, HIPAA obviously protects identifiable information. And if you take away the identifiable information, then you no longer have identifiable information and there is nothing for HIPAA to protect because there's no information being transferred. So in most uh, uh, kind of industrial uses of healthcare data, the golden standard is to have it not subject to regulatory limitations. And since this is not a healthcare presentation, I'm not going to go into how you do get it de-identified, but there are steps to do it. And the reason for outlining this is they're complicated and you have to build in those steps in order to get to that end result. 
Uh, now let me turn to the California privacy law. And um, this was enacted as part of um, the election that took place um, by proposition. And it's called the California Privacy Rights and Enforcement Act of 2020. It has its own acronym. And it expands on and in many ways attempts to close some of the loopholes and fix up what was in CCPA. It uh, uh, is a little bit unclear right now as to what is going to exactly be required. So I want to be upfront about that. Uh, it's going to be effective in 2023. Um, and during that time, we expect that the state will issue some regulations and provide some guidance, particularly as to the rights to individual consumers. So we want to focus on that. Um, but um, we're finding clients very interested in beginning their planning now because they've had the GDPR experience of finding out that it was very hard to build the underlying technology infrastructure to support GDPR. It was hard to put the processes into place and it was hard to use the data, I'm gonna say structure in a very loose sense, but to be able to retrieve from databases information that consumers were either able to request or request that the company act upon. So at a high level, this legislation does fortify and enhance consumer rights to their own data um, it expands the obligations that companies have with respect to the data they collect in the ordinary course of business. And most significantly, this legislation establishes uh, the first state privacy protection agency in the U.S. So for those of you who are familiar with GDPR, this is like a, um, a data authority. Um, and uh, since it doesn't exist and hasn't done anything yet, I can't give you more guidance but its purpose is to promulgate the regulations and protect consumer privacy rights. So it will act in a way similar to the GDPR. At this point, I wanna take a break and tell you that there are other similar state laws that are on the books or in the process of being uh, reviewed um, and analyzed. And there's one in Virginia, um, you may be familiar with the one in Illinois that restricts the use of biometric information there's one in Massachusetts. So we're in the problem now of having different states have different requirements that overlap. Um, so from a data management point of view, the issue is really kind of, you know, what's the common highest denominator and how are you able to, to build that in? And my cautionary note today is to let you know that there will be more of these coming. And, uh, it's your job to figure out how to be flexible enough uh, to allow the access and sorting of data that's necessary. But this is something that, because it's a regulation, uh, company, companies can't avoid it and they need to comply with it. I'll state that uh, the requirement is that uh, the company does business in California. So there are very few companies in the United States that don't do business in California. So in effect, it has uh, national implications and imposes requirements on companies doing business nationwide. So what does the law give consumers um, that implicate uh, data practices? One, they have the right to get information about how their personal information is collected, how it's used, and what the company's disclosure practices are. There are special rules and rights on sensitive personal information, which has much the same definition that it does under GDPR. And the consumer has the right to know, and the company has an obligation to inform the purposes for which uh, personal information is used and the particular purposes for which sensitive personal information is used. And that includes how it's collected and used, whether it's going to be sold or shared with third parties, how long it's going to be retained. And uh, I just mentioned this so you have a flavor of the scope of what people are going to be dealing with. You have to disclose if there's some financial incentive to get your data. And that will be a very interesting uh, aspect of this law. 
Okay, so this sets the scene now for what um, companies have to do to change their practice and what customers have the right to get from the company with respect to their personal information. And from my point of view as a lawyer, this means you have to have the right um, technology infrastructure in place and you have to have the right practices in place so that the data is assembled in a way that can be responsive to these consumer rights um, that can be exercised. Uh, let's talk about sensitive personal information. Uh, a consumer has a right to limit the company's collection of the sensitive personal information. Since it's law, there's always a qualifier. Here it's, but only sensitive personal information that's collected or processed for the purpose of inferring characteristics about a consumer. Um, as a lawyer, I can tell you, we sort of know what that means, right? You want to know gender, socioeconomic status, things like that. Um, but what's a characteristic about a consumer? That will be the subject of a lot of law going forward. And then uh, the, comp the consumer has the right to limit the company's collection uh, such that it's used only when it's necessary to perform services or provide the goods and services that an average consumer would expect when signing up to receive the average good goods and services. So um, that's uh, kind of a new layer and a new category for the use of personal information. And there'll be uh, regulations that will automate, I'm sorry, that will address the fact that uh, automated decision-making is here. And the law says that there'll be new regulations governing how you access and opt out with respect to a company's use of automated decision-making technology, including profiling. So the, the reason I'm discussing this is precisely because if someone wants to opt out, there has to be a mechanism that allows that to take place. Um, and there has to be a good mechanism because automated decision-making technology um, it's, it's probably hard to find some step that is an automated decision-making technology. Who knows if a smart chat bot is going to be considered to be an automated decision-making technology function. Um, it's certainly directed to whether certain people qualify for certain credit cards or certain mortgage rates and things like that. Um, so now we have this problem of consumers having the right to opt out of something that doesn't have any definition to it yet. And again, I want to emphasize that uh, you have to anticipate this to the extent that you can make sure that you can opt out from whatever automated decision making turns out to be. And probably the easiest way to view that is you have the right to just uh, enable an opt out kind of without respect to exactly triggers that opt out right. So what do we need to do at this stage? Um, we all have data. It's all situated in certain repositories and organized for certain purposes. Um, so now is the time to take steps to minimize effort and cost and not do this as a huge fire drill in 2022. Um, so now is the time to kind of audit and make some decisions on categorizing data to review databases and probably remove sensitive personal information that's not needed that was collected in the ordinary course back before this statute was enabled. Um, I always say the thing that helps is to add less data, which is to take away data that um, presents risk greater than it prevents benefit. Um, so this is also kind of data minimization, which can lead to cost savings. Now we look uh, kind of upstream where you have to coordinate with the rest of the business um, on the marketing and business to business contracts. Uh, there's a concept here of sharing data under the new legislation versus the old legislation selling data. So that means, um, you know, selling data was an exchange for value. Um, sharing data is not necessarily an exchange for a payment but it's probably in exchange for some other benefit. So we're gonna to have to see what that is. There is a huge impact on digital advertising, which again is outside the scope of this presentation, but 
it's hard to find advertising programs that do not have digital advertising components to it. What do I think needs to be done that's not directly part of data management? I think it's important to update contracts with your service providers, and this may be more of an IT function than a data function. So to the extent that it's an IT function, you want to make sure that two things are happening. One, that third-party IT service providers support the IT necessary to take the actions required to respond to consumer rights under the new statute. Um, and if they are data aggregators or sources of data, then you have the sensitive data problem and you need to know what is in there that you're acquiring. Uh, and finally, people will probably call on you from your company to help you update their websites because a lot of this information that I've dealt with at a high level has to be disclosed on a website. And here is where you can contribute because how you describe that functionality will have legal importance. And this should be done by people who um, I'm sorry. Uh, this should be done with uh, people who have a knowledge of data and how it, it, it is used and how it's collected and shared. Uh, another point is that uh, covered businesses, and covered businesses is the statutory term for um, basically companies that are subject to the registration, to the legislation, and they have to implement what are called reasonable security procedures and practices that are appropriate to protecting the personal information from unauthorized access, use, modification, et cetera. So here again, uh, knowing that there's an IT practice that has to be in place to protect unauthorized use and access um, is unauthorized use and access of what? And the what is the data and how it's set up is what enables the IT to do the IT functionality. So uh, to summarize this, the new statute, um, it's important to think of it and how it fits into the context of digit digitization and digital transformation and how it fits into corporate initiatives for data mining and business intelligence uh, and to bring better data science and better data management uh, to the data that the company has. And as I've mentioned several times, but want to emphasize, um, building in regulatory compliance up front is better than retrofitting. And if you do this, then the activities of a marketing function, uh, whether it's direct mail or chatbots or any other kind of business customer in a relationship, um, will avoid having uh, someone stray into an area that violates what the statute requires in the form of customer protection. And other points to mention are, as I said, remove, reducing the amount of data so that you are not having data that's not useful, but does present risk and liability. And then making a hard dive into how, lo how long you keep data given the data life cycle and its utility uh, is important. And there's a protection here against data breach liability. Um, uh, children's data is subject to different rules. And there's other liability that attaches to sensitive data. Um, you may be called on to help when there is a regulatory investigation uh, to be, I think, practically, to practically address this. Some of these investigations generate good headlines, but there is smoke without fire. But in any event, these are corporate activities. They're going to require showing that the company tried to do the right thing for the right reasons. And even if it was a little bit off and it's uh, achieving those goals, it was trying to do the right thing. And usually that works with regulators. Now let me turn uh, to uh, intellectual property. And this is an issue that comes up all the time. Uh, and I'm sure with other data lawyers as well, um, because people ask, can I own the data? And if I own the data, 
what offensive rights do I have in it? And what defensive rights do I have in it? And there are um, three basic intellectual property regimes that are relevant to this point. Uh, the first is copyright, the second is patent, and the third is trade secrets. Uh, the other intellectual property regime is trademarks, but that really doesn't really apply. So um, this is really important in two contexts. One is in the context of machine learning and what is proprietary and what can be shared. And the other is in the context of if you're trying to treat data as a monetizable commercial asset, um, how do you turn it into something with proprietary status so that you can, in fact, uh, be able to use it um, for that purpose. So let's start with a data element. An individual data, like today is April 21st, is not something that standing alone is protectable by copyright. So now we move on to databases. Um, so a database is a collection of data, at least as the copyright sees it, and the copyright law calls it a compilation. And how do you protect the database? This is a deceptively difficult question. Um, the law requires that the database have something special in the way that the data is organized. There's a Supreme Court case that says taking names and alphabetizing them however beneficial that is to making a phone book, doesn't have the necessary uh, requirements of a special effort to warrant copyright protection. Um, so that means if you have a database um, and it doesn't have any special structure to it, it's just kind of an obvious way in which to load the data, then you don't have copyrightable subject matter. And if you don't have copyrightable subject matter, you don't have a protectable database. So you now basically have an open source database. If you then sort the data in a certain way, um, then to the extent you, that you're introducing more originality, more structure and sequence, and more specificity into the organization of the database, then you start to approach copyright status. And copyright status gives you the right to protect it and copyright gives you the right to control um, copying of it, distributing it, using it, making derivative works of it, publishing it, and things of that nature that you can probably you know, draw on your experience and you're already familiar with that. Um, so if you can get the copyright status, then you have a legal basis to protect the, uh, to the database. Trade secret is the other regime that applies uh, and trade secret doesn't require the special organizational qualities in the database that copyright requires. It requires that you keep uh, the database a secret. So that's good if you are using it for internal purposes only, or at least using the database for internal purposes only. Um, when you get to uh, big data and data analytics, I think the point of both of those is to generate an actionable insight. And the insight is separate from the database. So having an insight and doing something with the insight, whether it turns into a business practice or not, um, is, is a good thing in and of itself, but it doesn't affect the underlying database. So that's a way to keep it a secret, even if it's not copyrightable. And then the insight itself can be protectable, and I'll come back to that in a moment. The big issue we're starting to face now is in machine learning, where machines, um, whether in pure machine learning or in deep learning, are starting to create their own databases. Um, so now the machine, really the algorithm, is starting to reorganize the data into different formats and different forms of organization. Um, so that, that's a good thing because it increases the copyrightable attributes of it. And uh, let me stop for a second and mention something I should have mentioned earlier. Uh, 
which is if you have a database and you meet the threshold for copyrightability through those attributes, the more you refine it and the more you make derivative works of it, the more likely they are to have this specialized quality to it. And therefore, the more likely the derivative works are to be copyrightable, even if the initial work was not. So now let me turn back to the point I was making about uh, databases created by machines. So we run into the copyright law question, which is, does a copyrightable work, and work is a term of art in copyright, does the work have to be created by a human being in order to be eligible for copyright protection? And the black and white answer is yes. So now we have a question of, well, what happens when the machine creates the database? And at the early phases of this, you can say that a human being created the algorithm and the software created by the algorithm did certain functions. So you can trace back those machine derived derivative works to the software that was created by a human being and therefore probably meets the character, the qualification of having a human created copyrightable work. At a certain point, however, the connection between uh, the algorithm created by the human being and the algorithm refined through machine learning and deep learning is going to be too attenuated. Um, and you're not going to be able to establish with the legal certainty where the human creation fits within this. So this will be an issue, uh, to put it mildly. I think the inclination of the Copyright Office will to say, well, you know, this just can't be free. There has to be some connection that we can use to protect it. And then there's going to be all the end users of this data who say um, no human creation, no copyrightable authorship. Therefore, it's open and I can use it without infringing copyrights. And the irony of this is that the databases that will be subject to this analysis are precisely those that have these, you know, specialized organizational schemes that are the result of very, very good uh, data science. So that takes care of the copyright analysis. Let me now turn, um, and I've addressed the trade secret analysis. Let me now turn to patents just to cover that up. So the way to view a patent in layman's terms is that a patent is a contract with the government. And the contract is as follows. The government gives the patent owner a 20 year right of a monopoly in exchange for the following bargain. At the end of the 20 year period, the patentable invention is now open for use by anyone. And you can't get a patent unless the patent provides enough instruction for somebody in year 21 to be able to do what the patent covers. Where do patents fit into the machine learning world? Well, um, software can be both copyrighted and patented. And there are very tricky legal questions that I think are, uh, I'm glad to answer offline if you, if you would like, but they're not really uh, data professional questions. Um, so the answer is, is that the algorithms can be protected by patent and also by copyright and at the same time. And uh, patent is very strong protection, but it requires government examination and issuance. Copyright is weaker protection, um, but it doesn't require that the government examine and issue the copyright. Um, if your second grader creates, uh, you know, an artwork by finger painting, that's probably enough to be copyrightable. And you just can file it and get a copyright registration uh, with the Copyright Office. Um, so we're in this land right now, whether you have to decide whether the software is patentable and or copyrightable. And just to add one more layer to this, the copyrightable elements may be different from the patentable elements and the patent inventor may be a different person than the um, 
the patent inventor may be different than the author for copyright purposes. And this is relevant when you have joint works developed by different companies. And uh, I'm just mentioning this because this is going to hit you when databases start being subject to intellectual property protection and more importantly, uh, disputes. So I have a question come in. I'm just going to scan it and read it and address it. It says, can a database collected from data collected through a copyrighted instrument, uh, test, et cetera, be copyrighted? Um, the answer is yes, um, depending on whether the instrument that is referred to in the question is itself copyrightable, in which case creating a database from a copyrighted database would be a derivative and infringing work. Uh, so if if the questioner would like to elaborate on that, I'll address that. Um, and then it goes, what if the instrument is trademarked? Um, I don't know what instrument means, but it doesn't matter. A trademark is a name that associates a product or service with a source of origin, and it has nothing to do with whether something is copyrightable or not. So the short answer to that is you can have a database and you can trademark it, even if it's not copyright, copyright protected. So um, please feel free to amplify that question so I can address it more. Um, I've come now to what I think is the key issue uh, in today's world, which is it's very difficult as a lawyer to negotiate an agreement over who owns what data. And the answer for, or the reason for that is uh, no one knows exactly what the scope of ownership of data is. Many people who are involved in this on both the legal and the business side um, are afraid to give up ownership because they don't know what ownership is and they don't know what they're giving up. And having a fight over whether they own it or not tends to go in circles because people are not willing to take the position that they don't own it for the same reason. They don't know if they're waiving a right that they already have. So if we take one step back, what are we really talking about in, in most terms? We're talking mostly about data use rights and the right to share data. Um, I had a situation once where I was recommending, I'm sorry, I was advising a company that had turned a charter aircraft into a network, into a hub and it collected all the data and then sent all the data back to the charter operator. So the charter operator could decide when to schedule maintenance and how to coordinate the logistics of getting a plane uh, to the base to perform the maintenance at the right time. Um, and the issue that we faced was all parties involved in all components of the aircraft we're claiming ownership in all the data um, because the data contained information about hours of flight. So that's the airframe people and hours of uh, engine operation. So that's the engine owner or the engine leaseor. And then you have all the telemetry and all that stuff. So for the reasons I said, we couldn't really solve the problem of ownership because everybody claimed they own what everybody else claimed they owned. The solution that I used was to say, okay, we are not going to have a fight about who owns what. We are just going to say, whatever you own, you are now granting me a license. And I can use the license to take this data, combine it with other data, send it to the charter operator, and the charter operator can repair the plane before it crashes. Um, and that was a way to kind of avoid the problem. But that has a certain limitation because that fits only within kind of a one snapshot in time set of use. Uh, so I have been working um, with Gwen Thomas from the International Finance Corporation, which is the private arm of the World Bank, and she's a member of Dataversity, uh, to develop this new paradigm that we're calling decision rights. And decision rights, I think, is a very interesting solution, and Gwen deserves a lot of credit for uh, for kind of thinking about it in this way. So taking the, the data professionals view of decision rights and put it into a legal paradigm, you end up 
with the following. Uh, you end up saying, okay, we have a bunch of data. Um, we're going to share it. The person who wants to be the recipient of the sharing is the person who um, wants to be able to do something to make the data operational. And to make the data operational, they need to take it, gain some insights from it, and make a decision. So now we go right to the end point, which is let's make a decision based on the data that we have. And then the decision will lead to an action. And then we have accomplished a business result. So as a lawyer, if we take this concept of decision rights, then we're refining the concept of licensing and saying, you have the right to use the data to make certain decision rights. So let's be absurd about this. Let's say you can take the decision rights and in my airplane hypothetical, you can decide how many times the plane can take off and land before it has routine maintenance on the landing gear. And that's all you can do with the data. You can use the data to make that decision. Um, and it re therefore says you can't use this data for any other purpose and you can't do onward sales of the data to third parties who can do it with other other purposes. An advantage to this paradigm that I see is it allows a company to control its data rights by putting them in what lawyers or at least what patent lawyers call a field of use. So in that example, the field of use is um, number of landings and takeoffs. Um, and that means that the same data can be licensed for a different field of use to a different entity um, without having there be a fight about the data was already licensed and no one really knew the scope of lights because I just granted a license to use it. Now, the benefit of decision rights is the people making the decisions can also be limited so that you're kind of protecting the dissemination of the data. And you deal with the onward problem of, okay, the license was granted, the decision makers made the decision within their scope of authority. And now that data is gonna be um, given to someone else for them to make another decision. So from a legal point of view, it is easier to structure this chain of rights as a set of rights because rights, it sounds like, and it is a legal construct. And that's what contracts do. Um, they give people rights to do something else. So I think the virtue of this paradigm now is that we're being able to look at data um, as a set of actionable activities. And we are defining its use in terms of what can be done with it and in advance deciding how to narrowly define that. Now, of course, no one has to be as narrow as the examples I've just given. But I think it's important to realize that as a lawyer looking at this problem, um, where ownership is both a messy legal concept and practically very hard to get a deal done when you're sitting across the table or even within a company trying to decide who has control over what databases. Um, dividing it into this more bite-sized piece with something that the law deals with very well, I think is a good way to accomplish what we're trying to do in most business circumstances, which is to share data and to use it. And to go back to healthcare, which is an example where I started, this would be a very important thing, right? You would like to be able to know what are some leading indicators of COVID and you're gonna have all kinds of information and you can go to Finland. Finland has this huge database of digital health information going back to 1953 on everyone. I'm not sure how or why they got there, but they have all this data and it is a very, very rich data set. Um, and you can imagine that if, forget your Finland for a company, just for a minute, just pretend you're a large company with this huge set of data that could be monetized in a billion different ways. 
decision right says you can use it for certain particular purposes. Um, and in healthcare, we're going to do it for research. We don't quite know the outcome yet because the whole point of research is to do research and develop it, develop things we don't know we're developing. But this is a paradigm that would enable that. So with that, I have come to the end of my time and I'm glad to take some more questions. Um, Actually, William, I think we are uh, a little bit out of time here. However, um, once the video of the today's session is posted, that chat over on the side will be open. I have a comment here that says super good and I'm grateful to receive it. And <laughs> still like to answer some questions. Of course, and we encourage all um, attendees so to continue I'm networking and chatting I'm in the share an observation chat. With you. So one of the issues in healthcare in particular is that now that healthcare uh, has come to grips with the cloud and decided that it's a secure enough IT environment to rely on, uh, we've discovered there's a problem with the cloud. And if you're doing a very tightly controlled internet of medical things, or you're doing robotic surgery, uh, and, you're rebuying, and you're relying on the cloud, the latency is actually significant enough to create a problem for the practice of medicine. So as short as that time period is, it's not short enough. So two things I think result from that. One is we're gonna see more edge computing, which is putting computing at the edge of the network. And we can debate on the definition of that, but certainly it's the devices that are collecting the data that are being used to make decisions. And secondly, I think there's going to be an overlap between the problems that healthcare faces and the problems that autonomous vehicles face. And, and what overlap do I see? Well, in an operating room, you need specific information very quickly to decide what your next move with the scalpel is going to be. An autonomous vehicle needs to decide very quickly whether that's a shadow or a pedestrian before it runs it over. Um, and in both cases, the cloud is too slow and you need some form of mesh networking to do this. So then a couple of issues arise in both circumstances. One is you know, cybersecurity, and if this gets hacked, then bad things will happen. Another is that bad things will happen um, just because accidents do happen. People do get hurt by cars right now, whether they're autonomous or not, and people do have unfortunate outcomes in medicine whether or not there's digital health or fancy cloud services behind that. But because the um, magnitude of the outcome, which is physical injury is the same, I think we're going to see a convergence of data practices uh, in auto autonomous vehicles and healthcare. And my final comment will be this, that I've, spent a lot of time discussing how it's very difficult to decide what ownership really is and how you decide that. Uh, as a lawyer, I predict that we are going to figure this out through litigation because there is going to be a lawsuit. It is going to be full of depositions and interrogatories and all kinds of pretrial stuff. But at the end of the day, the liability phase may be the phase that determines who opens who owns the data because in order to find somebody liable for a wrong they have to have some ownership interest or at least some proprietary interest in the thing that went wrong hey bill so while we are you know debating this as hey, technologies are deployed uh you know throughout the modern world lawsuits will arise liability will be allocated and ownership may be decided uh, in kind of a retrospective way, which um, I have an opinion about, which you can probably guess. But as things so we're five today, minutes over, and we got to jump off to the next session. You understand? Can you hear me? Your own data Natalie, can you hear me? And I its can. Yes. And okay. Expectations as to how it's maintained and organized, and so forth. I don't think you can. Problems hear are going to be solved at the contractual yeah. level. <laughs> while we wait for legislation to, shut the room. to to catch up with that. So Natalie, I am uh, at the end of yeah. my time. And well, uh, five minutes over, Bill. I'm afraid that we have to. My, yeah, he can't hear us. Up there. <laughs>
And uh, for those of you who didn't have time to send in a question or have something you'd like to follow up, I'd be more than glad to, uh, to receive an email and respond to your question. Um, I will tell you this as a lawyer, this is just a super exciting field and data professionals are super smart and it's, uh, 